Thanks. I thank you before for, for setting me up to do this and hosting it. Um, but thanks again for that, Matt. And also, I'm not sure if Kitsi is here or not, but thanks to both you and Kitsi for organizing all the fundraising that you've been doing. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just go start by saying I, something that other people have said too, I, that um, I definitely don't feel like a master um, when talking about East Javanese music or, or really any type of uh, gamelan music. Um, I'm not an expert in uh, Jack Dong shadow poetry, uh, really just an enthusiast. Um, but I do try to live up to the, the billing of this talk by um, telling you what I can about some of the master puppeteers and musicians in this tradition whom I've come to admire, as well as um, a few of the major scholars in the area. Uh, so to tell you about myself a little bit, I have a pretty long and, and checkered past in, in gamelan music. Um, the first time I played was at Wesleyan University with um, Pa Arjito and with Pa Marsam. And it was at a time when, when Pa El was, was there and was helping with some of the teaching too. Um, so that was my first experience. Um, and I, I, was, I, I just kept doing it again and again while as long as I was at Wesleyan. Um, then I went to Washington DC and played at the Indonesian embassy. Um, with Pat Morwanto. Um, and after that, um, kind of heard about Dharma Siswa scholarships through him and through other people in the, in the um, cultural office at the embassy. And so I went to do the Dharma Siswa program in Solo. And over the next, the years after that, I spent a couple of years in Solo and a couple of years in Jogja. And then lastly, um, a couple of years in Surabaya when I was, was doing my. Uh, Dissertation research. Is, is everybody still getting me, Matt? And, yeah, Steve, you're good. You could, okay. you, you could speak your a little before. louder, perhaps, but yeah. your eyes sounding good. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to say when I was in solo in the in the, the first time, I, I began getting really interested in these comedy cassettes. Um, and a lot of the comedy cassettes there drew on, this was really something even from the beginning when I, before that I was inter I, interested in comedy cassettes, which often central Javanese comedy will include a little bit of East Javanese music in it. Um, and I, I came to know some of this through uh, Pat Wakidi, some of the cassettes that Pat Wakidi played on. And I started listening to these old tapes and that actually was really my, my first kind of interest in East Javanese music came from these, um, comedy cassettes and things like that were that were coming from from solo and then I, then I started looking for all of the music from that was actually from East Java. Um, now when I when I did so 10 years later when I actually went to Surabaya to do this thesis research I'd, I'd obviously gotten through all kinds of ideas um, about the type of research that I wanted to do. The topic that I actually went there with um, in 2011 was an interest in, in looking for sort of a, a confluence between Javanese and Madhuri's music traditions in, in Solo, um, or in uh, Surabaya, I'm sorry. And I found that, um, I, I started off doing that and, and after a while I found that it was a hard topic to talk with musicians about because they did, they did, um, they did interact with each other and there were, there were occasions where they would be together um, these Madhuri's musicians together or comedians or whatever together with Javanese musicians. But most of the time it was, it was because of, of work. They just would get jobs that brought them together. That was, that was what tended to happen. And I found that when I interviewed people, um, if I went to a Javanese musician and said, you know, well, what do you, what do you think about Madhuri's music? It was, it was a difficult topic to talk with people about because, um, you know, I think that going to an, a kind of an expert or a, interviewing somebody, you, you, it's a good idea probably to talk with them about subject matter that is really what they're really interested in, not like to talk, go to somebody and then talk to them about something else. Um, so eventually my study, the study that I was working on in, evolved into a study of the working lives of Surabaya Gamelan musicians. Um, and doing that, I, I just started, had this idea to sort of follow the musicians that I knew around to a lot of different types of performances that they were involved with. Um, and one of the types of performance was, was this East Javanese shadow puppetry. Um, so 
it actually was not the most central topic in my research at the time, but um, as I kept listening, you know, going to um, Jack Dong shadow puppetry performances, I probably went to about 12 or 15 or something during the two years that I was in Surabaya. Um, you know, I kept getting more interested in it. And as time went on, even after I came back from Surabaya in 2013, I, I just, you know, I found that it was one of the types of music from that region, that, or types of performance from that region that I just kept listening to and wanting to learn more about and looking for you know, the few sources that are that are out there. I, I kept, you know, trying to get deeper and deeper into it. But a lot of that actually came after my um, main research was finished, which a lot of that had to do with um, uh, Ludruk, type of theater called Ludruk, um, another type of musical musical and dance performance called Sandur Madura. Now I will talk about those a little bit at the same time that I talk about um, Jack Dong puppetry tonight. Um, and one more thing I want to say is before really getting into the presentation is um, that it's a little, it's of course it's a little intimidating to start um, try to introduce a topic like a regional form of, of Wayankulit as someone who's not really a not really an expert um, in doing that in the shadow of this discourse on central Javanese music and Wayang that, um, as we all know, is very extensive and sophisticated. Um, so before I go further, um, I want to do this sort of typical thing and apologize ahead of time for um, any errors or any unclarity. Uh, I also want to ask for any corrections and insights that people have. Um, and then finally, I want to embrace a couple of cultural values that um, are highly prized by many Surabayans are not necessarily as celebrated in Central Java, although there are definitely, you know, ideas that people uh, do value there as well in certain circumstances. Uh, so one of the concepts, uh, blah, blah, um, being as open and frank as possible. And the second one is um, sa-anane, uh, sa-onane, right? Which can perhaps be described as humbling, humbly, humbly offering what you have, although it's uh, less than what you really like to give. So now I have to share. I'll try to share my screen, my uh, my PowerPoint screen. Let's see if I get this. Is everybody getting that, Matt? Yep, we got it. Uh, yeah. It's not full screen. But we do. Uh, Let's see if this is this. Will this do it? Yep, Oops. that's full screen now. Let me run back to the beginning. So the long presentation. Okay, so there we go. Musical and cultural worlds of East Javanese Jack Dong shadow puppetry. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that Jack Dong is synonymous with East Javanese Wayan Kulit or Wayankulit Jawati Moran. You'll often see it written that way. Um, I prefer in this presentation to use um, the term Jack Dong for three main reasons. Um, one reason is that the style is only prevalent in certain parts of East Java. It's not, it's not representative of the whole province. Um, the second reason is that um, I tend to think that it's better to, to call a style by a, its own name rather than rather than you know, giving it a directional name and call it as a regional variant. I think that if Jack Dong is just kind of catchier in the ear than, than saying East Javanese uh, puppetry, which makes it sound, you know, makes it sound peripheral right from the beginning. Um, and then uh, I wanted to mention also that in conversation, a lot of the musicians that I, that I know, new students, um, you know, if they were talking with each other, they might say, you know, you might hear people talking and saying, um, well, what are you going to do tonight? People will just say, oh, I'm going to jack dong on. Uh, that's all you really need to say. And people know that's, that's going to this East Javanese shadow puppetry. Um, and I'll just mention also that the term jack dong uh, derives from a, a cue that you'll hear over and over again um, through the night um, when, when uh, what, when the, the Dalang is cueing the musicians to start playing, usually to start playing those action pieces that we'll start talking about later. So it's just a very quick um, knock on the ketrek or the kaprak, um, that the, the, the ketrek, I guess I would call it, the metal plates that the Dalang has. They'll do that one time, a closed, real sharp, closed hit on those, and then the drummer will immediately hit 
dong after that. So the jek is the sound of the ketrek, and then dong is the um, follows that up right away from the from the drum. So I, I mentioned the areas where um, jack dong theater uh, shadow puppetry is prevalent are um, really just this area around that I'm kind of circling with the with with the cursor here. So from Surabaya, I'm not sure why this map says says Sarang there, but Surabaya, this little red area here, uh, Gursik, Lamongan, uh, Jombang, those two areas are sort of known to have it. I, I don't actually have a lot of personal experience in those areas, but they are areas that are known to have the tradition. Mojokurta and Sido Arjo, and then Malang has a um, East Javanese wine kulit tradition that is similar in a lot of ways, but it's also pretty, pretty different from the, the wine kulit traditions um, that are local to the, the northern, this sort of north coastal area. Um, so I'm going to be focusing mostly on, um, well, pretty much entirely on um, what goes on, what I, what I experience in Surabaya and then in uh, Sido Arjo and Mojokurto. Um, and then I, I don't really have concrete stats on the numbers of Jack Don puppeteers or performances, but it is safe to say that they comprise a fairly small minority of all, all Dalang who perform Wayang Kulip. Um, so this, this chart here, I don't think it's very reliable. It's from a, a, a book that was published um, under the name of Umar Kaim. It was published posthumously. Um, so Umar Kaim, a famous, famous um, UGM professor, uh, based on information that they collected in the 1990s. So you can see these, these figures, the number of Dalang in um, some of the regencies that are, that are closer to Central Java, where most of the performances tend to be more oriented towards Central Java. Um, these are the three biggest ones, okay? So, so there's, there's, and then these are three of the biggest, I think they're, I'm not sure that these are exactly the three biggest uh, Kabupaten for Jack Dong puppeteers, but they're, they're three of the bigger ones that are in that area that I outlined earlier. Um, so you can see from that alone that there's, you know, there's more, even in East Java, there are actually probably more, significantly more um, Central Javanese style, or sometimes in, in Surabaya, they'll be called Kulonan style performers. So they're called Western style performers if you're in Surabaya. Um, so I would estimate, you know, maybe in, in East Java, maybe a third of Dalang are, are Jack Dong puppeteers. And in, in all of Java or all of the Javanese language puppeteers, probably less than 10%, I would guess, are, are do this particular specialty. Uh, actually, let me wait for just a second. And then I would mention for, in terms of stylistic differences between um, Central and East Javanese and Jack Dong traditions, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about stories. I won't really talk about stories um, repertory at all, you know, beyond this. Um, I don't have a, enough expertise to say anything definitive on this topic. But um, one thing that is notable is that there's a clear affinity in East Java for um, stories of the older generations in both the Ramayana epic, which means um, these stories of a character called Arjuna Sosrobao. Um, stories about the, the birth of Rahwana. So there are these stories that take place way before um, the story of Rama and, uh, and Sinto that, that you know, we come to know, come to be very familiar for people who are studying performance um, in Java. Um, and in the Mahabharata too, they, there are a lot of stories that focus on older generations of characters that, that are not, we're not, not really familiar to me actually um, and still, they, I still find them confusing because they're not the ones that, um, you know, that I've been hearing about for years and years. Uh, these older generations that precede the Pandoa and the um, Koroa um, generation that's kind of the focus of most of what we see. Um, and I think w one reason possibly that this gets a little bit distorted or exaggerated is that the one of the, the puppeteers um, who teaches at SMKE in Surabaya is named uh, Ki Surwedi. Is very he's he's a very um, dedicated to to documenting these stories, and his his um, books he's written a, a book of Mahabharata stories and a book of Ramayana stories. He started from the beginning, so he just includes 
you know, the, these books that he has published are entirely made up of the very early stories, um, early in the story cycles, right? Um, and I should also mention that a lot of a number of the the um, popular stories in Central Java are also popular in Jekdong theater. So, um, one I, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Makoto Romo is one that um, the one of the one of the stories that Kitsi translated in, in, in one of her books um, is also performed in in this Jekdong tradition, and, and there are other others as well. Um, but at least for me. Um, more than the stories, the most distinctive, noticeable, distinctive features of um, Jack Dong performances probably are the music. And the, there are some visual symbols or visual icons, I guess, of the, of the genre that we can mention. Um, so I'll go through a couple of slides of these. Um, one of these is puppet ornamentation. You can see this is from, I think this may be from the Umar Kayam book that I mentioned, this mentioned earlier, this photo. Um, one of the thing, easiest things to notice is this different way of representing the eyes on characters. Um, again, I, I can't really identify um, East Javanese and, and Central Javanese puppets on my own, but you know, some characteristics like this way that the faces are drawn um, are, are very recognizable. Uh, another sort of small feature that you can notice is a different type of, of blancone or head covering that, um, that Jet Dong troops that I've seen at least usually wear. So I, I don't know if you can see it clearly enough in this picture to see, but it's a different shape um, than what you would see. Then you know, we have these distinctive styles in, in Solanese tradition, distinctive style in Jogjanese tradition. And then this uh, Jet Dong tradition also has a, you know, a different variation on the, the way that uh, musicians and other performers dress. Um, and then probably the the most iconic visual cue, at least for, for someone who's oriented towards um, the musical side of, of shadow puppetry, um, is a drum called the Kandang Gambiak. Um, and this picture, I don't, I don't want it to be too confusing to look at. This is just showing like a whole battery of, of drums. This is in the Eriri Surabaya um, studio, the Gamelan studio. And the, the drum that you see in the front is, is just a regular um, Kandang Gede, the big drum. Um, but both of those drums on either side, the green one that is over here um, and the, this lighter colored one here are different um, types of Jekdong drums or of, of Gambiak drums. Um, and they're, they're a little bit bigger than a Chibon drum, actually quite a bit bigger on the, the length, the length is not that much bigger, but the, the heads of the drum, both of the heads are much bigger. I, I would say they're probably like one and a half times the size of a chibon drum on, the, on the, the two heads of the drum. And it's a very heavy drum. Um, it's made of um, buffalo hide rather than a lighter type of skin. And um, it has, and, and it's wound a lot tighter than a, a central Japanese drum. So it has a very sharp and kind of crackling sound. Um, and I did want to, I wanted to mention the, the person who's in the picture here is, um, name is Ki, I know actually it's Mas Kuku, but Ki Kuku, Satyo Budi, who um, is not really covered as a, in here as a Jack Dong puppeteer, but he, he is a Dalang as well who, who combines styles. And he has, um, well, he, I should say he used to um, frequently accompany um, Antus Susmono. And when Antus, Ki Antus would come to Surabaya to perform, um, Mas Kuku would often be the person who would, would be the specialist who would, who would drum for them for their East Javanese um, repertory. So a couple of other visual some visual aspects of the of Jack Dong. There's different puppets. There are a few different characters that are these sort of comedic characters. Um, so in the, in the, in Central Javanese shadow puppetry, you would a lot of the time early on, especially today, it's almost obligatory to have this um, limbu an scene, the scene with two female um, servants who are just sort of talking between themselves, uh, and then you know singing songs or doing. Um, or sometimes it will just become a conversation with the puppeteer and the audience or the puppeteer and the um, and the other musicians. Um, so Limbu on the, the characters Limbu and Changik, who are the these those female char uh, servant characters, they do occasionally appear in Jack Dong puppetry, but more common than them really in the in sort of the time where this would occur, sort of early 
an hour or two into the performance. Um, more common are these two characters named Fatmundu and Fatmu Jenny, who are um, I mentioned. I just say here they work for the bad side usually, but they're they're just the, they're just sort of these regular guys that um, a lot of the time they're outside. You know, the scene is set when they're they're walking around or something, um, and and chatting. Um, and th these scenes, I mean, I'll mention later that these comedy scenes don't tend to be quite as extravagant or involved as the comedy scenes um, that we'll see and that we've probably many of us have seen in the real spectacular um, Central Javanese style style Yang of the last. 25 to 30 years. Um, okay, and then more, one more, one more example of it is um, of another set of comedic characters. It's a little bit of a difference in East Javanese puppetry with the um, Punokawan characters, the, the main Punokawan characters. So we have Samar and then Bagong. Bagong is sort of presented as the son of Samar. And um, then there's another character called Basut, who's like a miniature version of Bagong. Um, and he is uh, said to have kind of come out of a dream that Bagong had. So he just he just emerged spontaneously out of Bagong. And um, the way that um, the roles that they play, Samara, I think, is pretty similar, playing this old, regular person character, but a very old and wise person. Um, this is in terms if they're not actually if if they're acting in their sort of earthly role. Um, and then Bagong would be like a young, a younger man, or a, but who is mature. And then Basut is like a little kid, and he's the he's the the one who's sort of dumb and does a lot of silly things. Uh, but uh, Bagong is is not quite as um, absurd of a character as he is in in the Central Javanese tradition. Um, so I would say that there there is not much writing in English on the. Um, Jekdong or Jawatimuran Wayang tradition. Most of this has, at least in part, tended to highlight ways in which the boundaries of Wayang styles are blurred between regional traditions and pan Javanese traditions. And um, I won't go into this in detail, but there are just a couple of short articles that came out, I, I think, in the 1990s. Um, one of them is by Tony Day. Actually, that was in, in the um, Jan Razek's uh, edited book about puppet theater. Uh, that came out just after 2000, I think. Um, and then an article by Victoria Clara van Krunendel, which is, both of them did a lot of research in East, in, in East Javanese uh, shadow puppetry, but for whatever reason, the articles that they published um, were sort of dealing with topics that didn't really seek to define the genre. They more were looking at um, kind of real ways that, that, that it was not clear um, where the boundaries were. Um, so, in this presentation, I, I focus mainly on aspects that clearly distinguish Jekdong puppetry as its own style and tradition, uh, mainly because I feel that it ought to be more thoroughly approached and appreciated in its own right before, you know, before we really sort of try to decide how it's blending with other traditions and, and, uh, and with contemporary cultural streams. Um, it is certainly true that most Jekdong performances incorporate at least uh, some Central Javanese or trans-regional contemporary music in the course of the night. But I want to suggest that um, most Jekdong performers combine these elements with a certain logic. Um, in Javanese, we say, could say that they um, nango waton. Uh, so one key concept that underlies my understanding is a simple rule of thumb. Um, and that is that in certain respects and in certain instances, it's useful to think of a performance genre as having a core musical repertory or an, an identifying musical repertory as well as uh, some more flexible musical elements that are relatively open and adaptable and heard in ways that enliven a performance but don't really interfere with the identity of the genre. Uh, if we think of the music in Jack Dong's shadow puppetry in this way, then the distinctness of the musical style becomes very apparent. Um, many Jack Dong puppeteers will only incorporate um, Central Javanese Gunding and popular music and other types of um, kreasi, I call them other types of you know, sort of popular innovations, I guess you could call them. They'll only do this at lighter moments, um, often comical moments, like when the uh, Punokawan come out in the Koro Koro scene. And as we'll see later, in many cases, these scenes are very brief. Um, they may only feature two or three songs, which is quite a contrast from the over-the-top Koro Koro scenes that um, a lot of us got, probably got used to seeing around 2000 um, and, after, and even up in, right up until now, it, it still happens a lot. Um, it is very easy, 
thus very easy to recognize a core repertory that is stylistically very coherent, tied to the narrative progression and distinct from any other um, style of musical accompaniment for YM. Um, and now most, but not all of the Jekdong puppeteers that I have met are very conservative in their um, stylistic choices, generally staying close to performing in the way that um, they learned through imitation as apprentices or um, chantrik, word that we've, we've heard in a couple of um, these talks, chantrik with senior dalangs. Uh, this isn't always so, but for today, I'll save a brief mention of a few more innovative Jekdong puppeteers until the end of this discussion. I think that uh, for the most part, these younger Dalang are still early in their emergence, um, not yet at the point of taking the mantle of popular sponsorship from the older, um, old fashioned generation. And so another caveat, I actually I'll save that for a second, is that I, I don't suggest that the same degree of regional distinctiveness necessarily applies with regard to all aspects of the performance. Um, this is a question that I'm still thinking about um, as regards storytelling conventions, for example, um, a distinctively brusque um, East Javanese dialect and a more direct kind of etiquette is most likely e immediately audible to Javanese speakers as soon as they hear a Jekdong Dalang speak. However, there's also a great deal of phrasing and imagery in many of the conventional narration, conventionalized narrations or Janturan um, that is shared with um, that is shared with, from what I can gather, um, Wayang traditions all the way across Java. Um, so I just put an example. I, I don't think I will try to read this um, in Javanese right now. We'll, we're going to hear it um, a little bit later. Uh, do we hear it? Actually, I'm not sure if we'll hear it, but we'll talk about it in English um, a little bit later in the, the translation of it in Eng uh, a little bit later in the, in the talk. Um, so for people who've, who've looked at, you know, Heard a lot of Wayang texts, listen to them closely. This is these are phrases that are very familiar from a lot of puppeteers. A little bit, bit of a personal variation by this particular puppeteer, uh, Ti Suwoto Kozali, um, but it's it's very familiar uh, language um, in in a lot of Wayang traditions. Um, so now returning to the idea of a performance genre having a core musical repertory. Um, I want to just make one quick observation to show that such a notion has some currency among traditionalist um, performing artists in Surabaya. Um, and this is that the musical component of the popular stage theater genre called Ludruk, uh, you see the picture of it there, um, is often celebrated as an em it's often celebrated as an emblem of Sur Surabaya culture. Um, usually this accompaniment is this genre is only accompanied by a single gending that is highly variable, but it's only one piece of music um, called Jula Julie. So we'll uh, have a first act actual music example here, really quick one. That's one, about the shortest version of Jula Jula that you can hear, shortest and fastest um, version that you could imagine. Um, that's called Din Ta Kong, if it's played like that. But anyway, usually that's all what you hear for about 90% of the night um, in a Ludruk performance. Uh, sometimes though, if a Ludruk story is set far back in the mytho-historical Javanese past, and if the musicians are up to the task, they will decide to accompany the drama in a way that's called Chak, chak Wayangan. Um, in Wayang style. By, and they'll do this by substituting some of the pieces that we'll be hearing tonight. Uh, these pieces are um, Aya, 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 or uh, Kruchilan, Gumblak, and even an occasional um, Suluk or Mood song. They'll, they'll substitute those pieces for the usual primary accompaniment um, of Jula Juli. Um, so the implication seems to be clear that um, these pieces belong to the Wayang tradition, but they're being used in the Ludruk tradition. No, I didn't mean to do it. There we go. Um, so now on to more about what we're actually going to do tonight in terms of uh, listening. Um, I have had very few conversations outside of um, Jack Dong's home turf around Surabaya with people, uh, whether they're gamelan enthusiasts or not, who are very familiar with this performance style. Um, so I'm taking this opportunity um, to give a, to basically to give an introduction, musically oriented introduction that assumes 
some general knowledge of Central Javanese gamelan and shadow puppetry traditions. Um, this is a very narrow niche, but hopefully it is one that um, many of us um, fit into, uh, many of us who are on the gamelan listserv or who are otherwise in contact with um, Matt and with New Santara Arts. Um, so I've decided to organize the discussion around doing some focused um, listening together. We'll hear a few examples of what I think is a good cross section of, of kinds of core repertory in Jekdong performance traditions. Um, sadly, in the interest of time, I'm not going to include um, any of the more flexible repertory. So we're just going to kind of focus on the, the workhorse pieces. Um, we will talk about this a little bit, uh, talk about the more flexible repertory a little bit. Um, and the examples that I want to present um, sort of cover three basic um, types of musical compositions and their correspondent um, dramatic functioning within the performance. Um, so these, uh, I put them up here. Uh, first one is longer gunding that express um, a static feeling, usually of relative calm and beauty. This often will accompany um, meeting scenes in, in, in the course of the story. Um, the second, second category is sulukan or mood songs um, sung by the Dalang or mainly featuring the Dalang as, a, as the leader. Um, and then the third category is action music to accompany fights, movement, or stewing excitement, um, sometimes called gunding lampa, although, although that's a term that um, I've not really heard used in Surabaya. I'm not, even, I don't, not sure if I remember hearing musicians use this term in general, but um, you know, we've, we've probably seen in uh, publications the term Gending Lampa, at least. Um, and we'll go through these categories roughly in a sequence that would be typical in the early part of a Jekdong performance. Um, and with, with each of the examples, I have a few musical and cultural points that I want to highlight in relation to each recording. Um, in doing this, I'm really just hoping to bring forth some of the richness of the Jekdong tradition that I don't think is um, very widely known beyond the world of its hardcore um, regional devotees. Um, and just so that you'll know what's coming, um, these are the, the topics that we're gonna, gonna be getting into. Um, so first is Ayak Talu, that's the overture. Um, and I'll, in connection with that, I'll talk a little bit about other things that can happen before uh, the shadow puppetry show begins in a Jekdong performance. So that, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. And I'll also give a little bit of an overview of how the whole sequence of events goes through the night. Um, second, second musical topic is um, palungan, which is a term for a type of, of suluk that is unique to, um, unique to Jekdong, the Jekdong tradition. Uh, so this is the, about the poetic, and then I'll talk about this poetics of a special um, opening suluk that happens with, while, the opening gending of the of the um, first scene of the story is being played gendingo no kusuma, uh, and then third, listening for local sub traditions and individual styles in sulukan melodies. I think that one that one will be straightforward, and then finally this thing that I call playing by ear. And it's translated from the term budaya kupingan. It's not really translated, but adapted from a term called budaya budaya kupingan. Is um, I think was created by a. a East Javanese scholar named Aris Setiawan, who um, is a teacher at, now is a teacher at EC Solo, but he wrote his thesis about um, musicians at the at an East Surabaya radio station. So playing by ear, twisting the melodies of, of melodic contours of Ayak Wolu, that'll be the fourth little listening episode that we'll have. Um, and lastly, before we actually get onto the listening, um, I'm making a point, trying to make a point of crediting a wide range of Dalungs, musicians, and scholars throughout this presentation. Um, this is out of a desire to give them as much credit as possible, since I'm really just relaying as best I can what I've gathered from observing them and reading their work. Um, my thought is also that, um, especially in the last two or three years, many Czech Dong puppeteers have begun to develop solid YouTube presences. Uh, further watching or reading is, is now as easy as Googling a name. And my hope for this presentation is that it will get somebody excited to begin exploring this resilient and very vibrant Wang tradition further. Um, I strongly encourage anyone here tonight or watching the recording of this presentation to get on YouTube and search for more if your interest is piqued. Or, or you can also contact me um, for any like specific 
reading or viewing suggestions. Um, so now I, I appreciate the approach that Matt took in his Sakatan video of dropping the audience right in the middle of an overwhelming experience that is likely to be very unfamiliar. Uh, hearing music without much prior explanation has its own rewards. So let's just imagine that we're suddenly arriving at a performance by one of the oldest um, active Jekdong puppeteers, Ki Toyeb Jan Gondo Chorito, you see him in the picture, just as the overture piece called Ayak Talu is playing. Um, so we're going to co connect to YouTube to get this, and I, hopefully I will be able to do that smooth, to give you the link smoothly. Um, let, let, let me try to do Are you going to drop that link in the uh, chat box for us? Yeah, I might have to cut and paste. Oops. Let me, uh, are you able to do it from yours? I don't think. I can't copy the screen. Yeah. Let's you might want to, yeah, maybe get, get out of there and copy it. Are you, so you're seeing now my, uh, my your, screen. Yeah, your PowerPoint back end here. Yeah, but it'll be better if we can all click on it and watch individually. Yeah. So if I, I now I need to open my, do this. Um, if I want to drop a message, let's see. <laughs> Where is the chat? There it is. Okay, hopefully I'll get this. Okay. We can all just type it all in manually. <laughs> well, that's kind of, I think I got it now. Did everybody get that? Okay, so Steve uh, just dropped that link in the chat box. How long is the video that you want us to watch? Steve? That's what I was going to get to. So this is a pretty long, there's two longer examples that I have tonight. Um, this one, I wanted it to be sort of immersive, you know, just sort of getting into the, the mood of the performance. So I had planned to watch about seven and a half minutes of this uh, from the beginning of the video. Um, and this will start um, in the middle of Ayak Talu. Um, and we would listen to it up until the end of this uh, Patatan that immediately follows that piece. So that will be right around seven and a half minutes. Uh, oh. This is about as long as I thought would be tolerable in a presentation. Um, so I, I, I hope that it's not too long. But I did want to say, um, Suggest maybe if people want to, uh, we could keep, uh, you could keep using the Zoom chat box to uh, comment or ask a question or just to socialize while listening. And I will try to catch up on the, um, on the comments that have already been made, um, if there are any. Um, and then I do want to warn you that it's not a great quality image, but I do have a reason for starting with this particular clip, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, and then lastly, I want to suggest, um, that we listen, just take a minute or so to try to hear how the compool part fits in with um, the overall texture and with the, especially in relation to the, the um, sarong. <laughs>
Now, why did I choose that that particular video? I, I kind of apologize for, for giving you one that is not the best quality. There are other videos out there that are better than this one. Um, I started with this particular clip because I just because I thought it was the right about the right length for setting the mood, um, and more importantly, um, out of concern for for um, what I thought of as sort of a fairness in deciding what puppeteers to highlight. Um, I don't know how many people will eventually see this, but I, I, I feel sort of guilty just choosing a particular puppeteer who um, idea. one one who would have good video um, to, to present their their example over somebody else's. Um, so in my thinking, and it, it's something actually that I think would be interesting to talk about afterwards, um, if people are interested, um, is how, yeah, my, my thinking about it is to, to sort of give top priority to the, the Luhur or the, the older generation of the, the, the influential puppeteers who have already passed. This is in this particular kind of introductory discussion, especially, um, we'll get to these people in a bit. Um, I don't think anybody would protest the choice of, of choosing to to present one of these very honored older um, puppeteers. Um, but in the, in the case of these, these people, there are really are only um, audio recordings available or, or, or video that's about equally bad quality. Um, and then I thought, you know, second priority maybe would go to the older generation of performers. Uh, Key Toyeb happens to be possibly, probably is the oldest active puppeteer in this tradition right now. Um, and for me personally, he's kind of an appropriate person to, to feature because um, he was the first person who invited me to see one of these performances, and he's the one that kind of got me hooked on it. Um, he just, when I was a few months into my research, he um, somehow got my name and, and contacted me and said I, I had to see this style of performance. And um, we went to his house and they kind of took us, you know, took us the whole performance and, and uh, his family was showing us around. So, so I don't know him all that well, but I felt like, you know, that's a good enough reason to feature him over, over someone else. It's not because he's the best performer or I, I really think you should see this one. He, he's a good performer, but um, he's one of many. Most of the rest of the talk, I will be focusing on these early performers who are, who've all, have already passed away. Um, and then I want to mention what we heard that excerpt was actually only, it was only the second half of the full um, Ayak Talu. So um, it, maybe somebody noticed that the, the Kampool was playing um, twice at twice the frequency of the basic melody or the melody played by the Damung and the Slantum. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I, should, I, mean, I, I don't think I have the melody in my head right now um, to actually try to imitate it. But the the Damung melody is going at about like a Iromo Dadi type of speed, you know, one beat like every second or so. Kampul twice as fast as that. And that is called Ayak, uh, Ayak, Ayak Kampul Karap. Um, the first, there's a first half of this piece that is called um, um, Ayak Talu Kampul, Kampul Arang. Um, it is, it is sort of like the Kanang in Sampak. It's, it's not as, not fast like that though. It's very, it's slow. It's like once, you know, Kampul once every half a second or so. Um, so in the first half of this is, is called um, Ayak Kampul Arang, where the Kampul is being played at the same time as um, as the the Dumung melody, um, more relaxed feeling. Um, it's, it's the general rule. Um, actually, I'm, I'm sorry. Take that back. It doesn't. It it in this particular case. Um, initially, the ayak kampul ayak talu kampul arang is is a very um, expansive piece. At first, it starts with uh, kampul playing only once every kotro, and then it goes through the speed up. Um, and the reason I wanted to mention this is because it kind of ties in with Chris's discussion discussion um, the other day. So it starts off at this very expanded um, version, uh, Kampula every every go throw, and then this, the the tempo doubles after after a few minutes, speeds up, and then the the Damung melody cuts back. So you end up with the Damung playing at about the same speed, um, but the um, Kampul is playing on every second Damung beat at that point. And then this happens again, um, speeds up again, and then you get to sort of a, what would be like a normal um, kampul arang um, relationship to the Damung melody, which is every beat. And after that, then um, I, I kampul arang ends, and there's just a very brief pause and, a, and this little drum flourish, and they'll go right into um, I kampul karap. Um, so it, it's interesting, this, this, kind, this kind of condensing pattern happens in 
in the East Javanese ayat, ayat, but it is not seen as being separate pieces. They're all parts of this piece called Ayat Kumpul Arang. Um, this is, that's one of the things that I, really interesting to listen to. It's hard to hear what is going on. So if anybody is interested in it and they want notation, um, I'd be happy to send it to them. I didn't really want to feature it here because it's, it's just very confusing notation to look at. It's, it like would take all of your attention if you, if you actually tried to follow it. Um, and I, the next, so the next point I want to make is that um, Ayat Talu, Talu is not the beginning of the performance. It's um, only really the prelude to the puppet show itself. Um, so most of the Jekdong Dalang that I saw wouldn't um, actually sit down behind the screen until about 11 p.m. or even 12 a.m. Um, the gamelan itself, though, would and a whole variety of entertainments um, would usually begin playing um, three to five hours earlier in the evening. Uh, so they might start performing at like seven o'clock or eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Um, but the, the, the shadow puppetry performance itself wouldn't start until you know, a few hours later and all kinds of other things in between. Uh, so some of the different things that, that often happen before the Dalim sits down include um, this list that I show here. Um, so something that I've never actually seen happen um, one of the older sources that you can look at, a, a book written by um, by uh, East Japanese scholar named uh, Sinarto Tino. He has a whole list of, of these coming on and loud playing pieces that can be played. They're all in Sundronum, hours worth of material that could be played before a YN happens. But uh, I've never seen that, so I, I'll just say that it's very rare if it happens at all. Um, and then something that I have seen happen or have heard happen, I should say, um, well, I've seen it happen too, actually. Uh, you can extend the sort of Talu feeling a little bit further back um, by proceeding I, I, with another piece that is called um, Gadog Sundarum, or, or you can just play a piece called Gadog that um, probably to somebody with a central Javanese background would sound like a very slow, um, very refined kind of, well, it's not, not maybe refined in the right word, but very slow, um, I, I, so when I, I, when, it, when it slows down into um, Iroma 2 or Iroma 3, um, feeling is, is kind of similar to that. Uh, that's action, feeling of action sort of builds up, but it's, it's very, of, of stirring excitement, but it's very um, uh, refined. And this is something that is done pretty routinely in the um, Eredi Surabaya's um, Saturday night YM broadcast. And most of these are, um, of those broadcasts are recordings um, and they sort of alternate on the Eri Surabaya Saturday night broadcast, they alternate between East and Central Javanese styles. Um, another thing that you can see before the, often we'll see before the puppet show starts is the Remo or Nremo opening dance. That is almost always done if it's a, a Tangapan performance, right? a, a performance at a wedding or some kind of an event that somebody is sponsoring. Um, and you, of course you can read, I won't really talk about that dance at all tonight. It's, I think it's too too much of a separate topic. But there is um, Christina Sunardi's book that came out recently um, that you could look at if you want to know more about, about that. Um, so then there are these last two are sort of the big things that happen a lot of the time before uh, Jack Dong performances start. Um, something that is called Andong Andong, which is it's very similar to Tayuban. Um, also something called Remo Tambalan, because it's a lot of the time, the way that it's presented is that the female dancers will come out. Um, female dancers dressed as, as um, in male characters, usually when, when I have seen it at least. Uh, so dressed as sort of like a male soldier-like um, character. Um, they will come out and start dancing Remo, but then in the, in the middle of it, they'll, they'll sort of pause for a little bit. And then there's a, there's a period of time when people can, in the audience can start asking for them to um, play a, a specific piece and and one or one or two of the guests will come up and dance um, with the Remo dancers. Um, so that's Remo Tambalan or also called Andong Andong. Um, that is yeah, very similar to Tayuban if you've heard of it, but it, it does not follow quite the same etiquette um, that you would see in, in, in Tayuban performances have um, a pretty strict order of who dances when um, also feature a lot of drinking. Um, and this Andong Andong and Remo, the people may drink during that, um, but it's not a central part of the activity. 
Um, and then finally, the fifth big thing that can happen before um, before the lying starts is um, live tambursari, dangdut, or popular music, or pop music like pop Jawa or pop even pop Indonesia um, could be performed. And that is often interspersed with you know a lot of comedy bits by the hosts of the of that part of the night. Um, and of course, if it's tambursari, that would would frequently involve the um, musicians in the gamelan who will play through the whole night. Um, so it, when you think about um, a performance that is being presented in that in this kind of a way, um, you know, it's like a variety show um, that is capped off at the end with uh, an intense um, musical drama. So it's not not really just a musical drama. It's all of these things leading up to it. Um, this is similar to the structure of, of um, Ludruk theater and in the past of um, another type of performance that I um, studied called Sandur Madura. Um, today it's not exactly like that, but in the past it was could be multiple days long with all kinds of attractions ending in this drama. Um, it's worth noting that many Ludruk performers today um, use Dutch terms to refer to the, the sort of variety segments. So they'll talk about um, atraxi, um, the story they will call the toenail, um, things like that. Um, and this suggests that there's a long history to this kind of entertainment format. Um, and lastly, I, one more thing about this I would say is that as a, as a sort of a fan and a participant observer, um, I really enjoyed the experience of this varied kind of Jack Dong performance um, for a few reasons. One is that the, the shadow puppetry performance is, is not all that long, but it's, but it's intense. Um, Another reason is that I could wander around early in the night, kind of, you know, you kind of absorb the early part of the performance as you want to, and then you sort of sit down to focus once the, the late night part begins. Um, and there's ample time for, I think for the audience, that there is ample time for an entertaining um, window to the present to sort of draw upon the idea that um, Jan Razek presented about uh, the Goro Goro. So you can open up this window to the present in the form of popular music and comedy in the early evening at the time when the largest crowds are present. Um, later in the, later on in the evening, the, most of the VIP guests and other guests who are not deeply interested in the Wayang will actually leave before it starts. Um, so you don't have that um, situation that, we, that probably a lot of us have seen where at a certain point in, in a long a Wayang that starts earlier in the night, all of, all of these um, important people will sort of just start marching out at like 11 o'clock or after the, a lot of them after the Limbukan scene is finished. You'll just see all these people leave. That doesn't really happen with um, Czech Dong theater, the, if it starts late at night like that. Um, and perhaps this is why many Czech Dong Dalang include only a little bit of popular music and spectacle once they've started um, getting into the story. Um, so um, before we move on to the next example, I want to um, just talk a little bit about Patap. Um, which we've, there are sources that discuss this, but there's sort of a speculation that I had about the, the late night start time in, um, that a lot of Jack Dong performers um, like to do. And that's the question is, you know, is there a relationship between these conventional start times and the sequence of Patip through the night? Um, probably mo a lot of us have read sources that say, um, associate um, Patip, with specific times of day, not, not just with you know, the sequence of the performance, not just the first part of the performance, the second part and the third part, it can also be associated with actual times, right? Um, so um, it's a little tricky to talk about East Javanese Pata in relation to Central Javanese Pata just because of these that's kind of difference in language and that you have to use number, a lot of different numbers in different ways. Uh, so I, I tried to make this chart that shows the equivalencies. Um, in the, the traditions that I was familiar with, these are the ones you know, right around the periphery of, of Surabaya, um, the slendro tuning dominates. Um, some groups will add paylog tuning as sort of a variation, but the, mainly it's thought of the, the night, you know, people think of it as being in slendro. Um, they will start the performance with um, slendro sapulu, it's called. Um, and this is similar to Slendro Num in Central Java, low two being the, the strong, the sort of theoretical strong tone. Um, one point that is 
uh, a little bit ambiguous about Pratat Sapulu, especially in Wayang, is that a lot of the pieces that are played, um, even though they're Pratat Sapulu, they end in Angong 5, so that um, it can be difficult to distinguish, um, you know, just from, if it's a short piece, especially, it can be hard to really tell whether a piece is considered Slendro Sapulu or the next mode called uh, Slendro Wolu. I mean, it could say it doesn't matter that much, or that it just depends on context in that case. Um, but that's, so in this chart, um, they sort of line up well. What this is, the the left side I'm showing um, times that I observed as being sort of typical in Jack Dong performances. It's not from a, another source. This is just my own rule of thumb. Um, so the, the times that Slender School will be going will be that first hour of a performance um, until about 1 a.m. And that is pretty close you know, if we look at absolute time to the time when Slender Num is happening. Um, so the, then the next part at Slender Walu in, in East Java, um, this switch occurs um, immediately after the opening ginding is finished, ginding Kondo Kusumo, which we'll, we'll listen to in a part of it in a, in a few minutes. Um, and typically, like the vast majority of the of the drama takes place in Patat Walu, um, so you can see it here. It's a, I, I put it down as being three hours of Patat Walu and about a little over two hours of the other two, other three Patat. Um, and then later in the night, uh, Slendro Songo in in um, East uh, in Jack Dong tradition is similar to Slendro Manuro in in central Java. This is where all of the confusion comes if you're trying, if I'm trying to, when I have tried to teach these pieces in a class, it's always confusing to say, oh, this is Slendro Songo, because that could be Manuro, or it could be, it could be Gong 5, or it could be Gong 6, right, depending on whether we're talking about East Java or central Java. That always gets difficult just in terms of language. Um, and then finally, um, there's an optional mode that, um, called Slendro Sarang, um, or I like to call it attack mode, which is kind of a literal translation of it. Um, Gong three, um, all of the pieces I think in this in this mode um, end on Gong three. Um, the melodic range is very high, and it's only played for the last few minutes of the show, if at all, um, during a sort of encore battle um, called the um, Perang Dugangan or Perang um, Gagahan. Okay, so now we are ready for the second listening topic. Um, we will speed up, these listening topics will speed up a little bit and they become less, um, more sketchy as we go on. Um, so this one is kind of somewhat, somewhat involved, but the, the third and fourth are, are going to be more just listening. Um, so we broke away from that last video clip just as um, Kitoyib was about to start setting up the first meeting scene or Jujur in that night's story. In the Jekdong performances of recent decades, this invariably means that the gamelan is preparing to play Gunding Gondo Kusumo. Um, the lore and published literature on East Javanese shadow puppetry agrees that there were in the past um, a few different options for this opening Gunding, which um, varied according to which kingdom um, the story opened in, uh, similar similar to the what you know what what can what how things can be decided in Central Javanese Wayang. Um, but at least for the couple, for at least the last couple of generations, the practice has been to open the scene with um, Gondo Kusumo in all cases. Um, and one caveat that I would make here um, is that there are some fairly conventional dalang who um, now may include an action-filled prelude scene, uh, which likely reflects an influence from dramatic in innovations in Central Java. And this, I think, maybe ties in a little bit to the um, Wayang Padat trends uh, that you can read about in, 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 and watch in, in Kitsi's um, translation books. Um, one example that I can remember, um, because mainly because I've listened to the recording a lot, is um, when this Dalang named Ki Dadang Kurniawan, uh, better known as Eriri Surabaya, uh, comedian, singer, and dancer, um, Chak Dadang. So he kind of goes by both of those um, titles, depending on what he's doing. Um, Open, he, he opened a live radio broadcast Wayang with a lively scuffle between the um, heroic giant character Bima and a, a porous ogre who, um, in that story, I think that the ogre had allied himself with, um, with a foreign king um, named Bandung Nogosewu. So this was sort of, it's, it's a scene that was 
um, setting up the story. It was not just a random opening scene. It was something that was sort of setting the stage for the, for the meeting that would come right after that. Um, and after that prelude scene was done, the group moved on to Gondo Kusumo and a conventional Jajar scene. So there can be those little kind of insertions that can be added in, but it's, it's not, not um, it doesn't happen a lot, I would say, but it does happen some. Um, and then just quickly, I mentioned, um, since I'm talking about a sort of a big ending in, within the context of Wayang, um, um, or more accurately, maybe would be to say a placid and atmospheric full ensemble piece that usually would, on, would um, accompany a sort of static scene. Um, there are only a handful of other East Javanese gending that are played regularly during Tijer scenes occurring later in the performance. And among these are the ones I've listed here. So um, Titi Pati, Lambang, Dudo Bingung, Jonjang Gaga Setro. Um, so you may, um, I don't know who has access to the, the notation of those pieces, but you, at least you have a list now of, the, of those pieces. Um, but oftentimes Gondo Kusumo will be the only sort of stately gending that is heard for the entire night. Um, so ideally we would listen to Gondo Kusuma in its entirety right now. Um, it's perhaps the best example of um, an often unrecognized um, capacity for subtlety and expressive depth in East Javanese gamelan music. Um, but Gono, Gono Kuzma is very long. It's about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, it's very complex and it, it also accompanies a number of long and complex actions that are performed by the Dalan. So um, we'll listen to an excerpt and I'll recommend uh, watching the first hour or so of a quality Jack Thong video online if you're interested to hear more. Um, part of what makes this East Javanese um, gunding, Gondo Kusumo, it's uh, similar but not the same as a Central Javanese piece by the same name. Um, part of what makes it complex is that the melody progresses through numerous distinct gong cycles with the parts of instruments like the saron varying by only a few seemingly minor differences. Um, in fact, these are adjustments made as the Pasindan sings verses in different vocal ranges as the piece goes on. Um, since the sequence of gongan can vary quite a bit um, depending on the, on the Dalang's needs, um, this is a gending that demands that musicians play by ear rather than as notated or in a memorized sequence. Um, and we'll get back to the idea of ear culture or budaya kupingan um, in this sense, uh, the idea that you have to sort of adapt the, the uh, sometimes the musicians will actually be listening and, and shifting the melody in response to, to something that's happening. Um, so you're not, you're not sort of following a standard version of the, of the particular gending um, at all times. Uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and um, I want to just briefly describe the main actions that are performed by the Dalang while Gondo Kusuma is playing. Um, so there's sort of three segments. They're all pretty long, like 10 or 15 minutes long each. Um, so first is removing the kayon, the, the central mountain puppet, and then um, really patiently setting up the puppets one by one, each of them with a choreographed movement pattern and a corresponding rhythmic accompaniment until the opening uh, mise-en-scene of the story is complete. Um, after that, the Dalang um, encants a lengthy sung poem called a palungan, um, these are the Dalang's first words within the context of the performance. And um, they're a special kind of sulukan that is unique to the Jekdong tradition. Um, and then third is a uh, long and partially formulaic opening narration setting the stage in the palace where the story begins. And that is the Janturan, just, just as it is in um, Central Java. Um, now the excerpt that I want to play for you is the second of two um, of the two longer recordings that we're going to hear tonight. So this one um, is an audio recording from a 1980s uh, Erer y Surabaya radio broadcast that uh, later became a commercial cassette release. Uh, the performer is the Dalang is Ki Suwoto Gozali. Um, the accompaniment I think is is the Erer y Surabaya musicians um, and uh, Kisuoto Gozali was the, the resident puppeteer of the radio station for, for a long time, up until he um, died in 1993. Um, 
And Ki Suoto is one of the three Dalang who I'll describe as the immediate um, Laluhur or pre predecessors of much of the Jekdong puppetry style prevalent in the districts around Surabaya. Um, the excerpt is about eight minutes long and it features at least a little bit of all three segments of the Dalang's actions as I've, as I've described them. So we get about a minute or so of um, the full ensemble playing at moderate volume. This is the end of the setting up the, the, the initial mise-en-scene. Uh, then we'll hear the whole Pulungan section, which is, is, is long, it's, um, but it's very lyrical. I, that's why the main reason I think it's a good one to listen to is because it's, it's, a, it's a very striking um, poetic text. Um, so it's, it, that takes up two very expansive uh, gong cycles, about five minutes. Um, and then uh, eventually the, the tempo and volume pick up slightly and we'll hear a second type of sulokan, kind that um, Patris mentioned the other night uh, called kombangan or humming or the, the sound, when you hear the, the dalang into, intoning like, oh, oh, that, that type of stuff, that is the kombangan. Uh, that goes on for most of another full gong cycle, but a little bit faster gong cycle and is said to be a moment in which a Dalang may insert some brief prayers or mantras. Um, and finally, we'll hear the gamelan settle back down in just the first few seconds of the opening um, chanturan or narration. So. <laughs> Bayangku makhluk e dalam kotak kayu kuburan sejati tutup dur popo aku dasar nisor ibu pertiwi Rojok songgo buono larapa Minongko buntolo tundo oh sabto Kliken kutuping bumi palunto Tejo mangkara paluntur tejo mangkara Kelir minongko jagat rinolan wengi Yano pragi ing kelir tableng bumi Kerawat gandali ne jagat Kepiaring lintang bimo sakti lencongku Toro Pro Pak 
بیاد بیشم بنیو میلیوی چران پنت پس بومی Karingong ang kakondot yang ang ringgit pagdal niko. Yantur, jaman purwo, trito purbo kolop kundi to kang iwiwiting kondo china ito. Anya ya satu. Cecere negoro kuru janggolo. Kau di dosa puru, kau kau ketuk si marang sawiji. Okay, so sorry about the difficulties with that. Um, are you hearing me now, Matt? I just want to make sure. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, fixing that, it sounded much much better afterward. Yeah, yeah. I um, so also sorry about missing missing a lot of the text. I guess so I'll, I will leave this up for a couple of more minutes if anybody. I guess it goes slow enough. You can probably read it pretty quickly. Um, I did want to mention the translation um, is mine, um, and I, it's still I've been working at it. Um, I haven't worked at it recently, but I was working at it for a long time. Uh, but it is not a final translation, not a final version that I'm really confident in. Um, so if anybody is um, a fluent Javanese speaker who has comments, um, I would I would like like to hear those. Um, and then I, I also wanted to mention um, the there's this you probably noticed this nice uh, back and forth that goes on between the Dalang and uh, one of the Pasinda and one of the Warangono. Um, 
And that, that is, um, I believe, was composed by, uh, by Suo, Suoto together with a Pasindan named um, Nyi Sulika, who is, um, some of you know, um, Sukesi Rahayu, who is a, a well-known central Javanese Pasindan and also a, um, a um, docent, a, 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 an instructor at EC Solo. Um, she did her thesis about basically it's about um, Nyi Sulika's vocal style, about East, East Javanese uh, Sindanam. So um, I, I, yeah, I wanted to mention that because I know a lot of us know Casey um, and yeah, she, she also knows this um, Nyi Sulika. I, I don't think, no, if Nyi Sulika is actually singing on that recording, but um, I don't think so. Um, now I wanted to mention that um, when I first heard tried to understand the words of Kisuoto's Palungan, I was struck by what a stunning ode to Wayang performance it is. Um, and a little later on, I was further struck to notice that um, many of his uh, sulukan throughout the night drew attention to the physical and social setting of the performance. Um, this led me to have some thoughts about why. Um, it's always a dangerous thing to do that, but, um, but I did. Um, and I came to think that maybe by highlighting the poetics of the performance event um, so often, uh, Suwoto was celebrating the communal nature, nature of people coming together for a performance. Um, this sense, uh, and it's, it's important to note that a lot of his performances, the ones that I have heard, are all radio performances. So it is possible that he may have um, emphasized that because it was not an actual gathering of people. There was not an actual physical setting, but he was drawing it through the, through the text. Uh, so I don't know, that is a possibility. Um, but uh, this sense also seems to be evoked in his explication of his variant of one of the classic opening lines in his Janturan. So what we, we saw um, earlier for a minute, we saw this um, kind of classic formula that, that Dalang say at the beginning of, of the performance. Um, this is another one where I would like to hear somebody's, if anybody who is more knowledgeable has comments. Ka eko adito so puro wasono. Ka eko, that means towards one, adi, exalted, doso ten, purwo means a person begins to tell a story. And then this is the part I have a question about whether, um, I have not heard wusono being made a part of this little text. Um, so then uh, Suwo, the Dalang says, and what is wusono? Wusono or finished in the art of the Dalang means getting through the night. Um, so again, it's kind of drawing attention back to the materiality of the performance. I, I find that interesting. Um, so I know that this talk is getting long and we still have even more listening to get to. Um, so I just want to draw a very brief connection between this idea of people coming together for a performance and um, an interesting aspect of Jack Dong sponsorship. So the relationship of puppeteers to the people who sponsor performances, which is almost invariably um, private individuals and families. Um, some individuals and families in areas where the Jekdong tradition is very strong take on a long-term commitment to a particular Dalang by joining an informal mutual aid organization set up specifically to help other members of the group sponsor performances by that Dalang. Thus, when a member uh, family, when a member family throws a wedding or a circumcision party or any kind of life cycle event that's appropriate, um, as long as they time it properly, they will have a substantial fund to draw upon um, in order to pay the performance expenses. And then, of course, the other um, members of this Arisan, of this group, um, will, will likely be guests at the performance. So this whole group kind of, you know, gets to see this one puppeteer for their whole lives, pretty much. Um, they might see other puppeteers as well, but they have this commitment to the, the one puppeteer. Um, they also um, very likely will make I'm sorry, I just said that. Um, so I've heard more about this sponsorship than I've witnessed it. Um, but there is another scholar of Jekdong puppetry um, named Wismo Cristanto Nugrojo, who has written um, on this practice in um, a couple of published articles, and I believe also in his um, Gajamada University dissertation on Jekdong. Um, and I did want to ask if anybody has a copy of that because it's 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 not it's not one that I have been able to access online. Um, it's also worth noting that I spent um, considerable time um, 
in the company of a large Arisan-like organization that functions at least in part as the sole sponsor of um, traditional Sandur Madura performers. Um, noting, and I, I don't really have, we definitely can't talk about what Sandur Madura is, but it's another performance genre that has this form of, a similar kind of form of sponsorship uh, organization. Um, and I, I think that noting the existence of such networks for communally supporting the arts uh, seems to give a whole new immediacy to the notions of um, community building through expressive culture and um, to the resilience of these rather peripheral traditions. Um, and finally, before moving on, um, although I did spend a number of years living in Solo and Jogja, um, I find it difficult to speculate as far as um, how specific this form of collective sponsorship um, is to Dong or perhaps to this uh, cultural region around um, northern East Java or East Java in general. Um, it is difficult to distinguish from uh, one's own experience over a long period of time, um, whether differences are rooted in place or in changing times. Um, I suspect also that a larger contrast in sponsorship patterns might be noted if we were to compare um, spectacular or superstar variants of Wayang to the performances of lower profile Daoing with local clientele. So I guess the question would, you know, would, would there be a bigger difference between funding of the superstar puppeteers and local puppeteers or a bigger difference between um, sponsorship patterns um, in East and, and Central Java? That's a, a question. Um, but anyone who has been a part of organizing a wedding in, in Central Java knows that um, there too, many families will fully draw upon the resources of their extended families. Um, neighbors and other associates to help pay for everything. Um, it's possible that the difference is thus more one of emphasis or explicitness or um, outward meaning than in the actual mechanics of how funds are gathered by performance sponsors. Um, so I wanna ask, um, I know we're going, we're going pretty long. I, I don't have a clock here, but um, I have a third and a fourth topic um, I guess the question, we, we could skip one. Um, does, does anybody have an opinion? Does, or do, do we have the, the uh, strength to go through another whole, whole set? These are those, uh, maybe they're maybe. quicker. They are quicker, but not, I mean, they'll take some time too. They're, they're not as long as these earlier ones. Yeah, maybe we could just do a listen with uh, maybe a shorter explanation. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try to do that. Um, so um, yeah, the third example, um, is hear, hearing regional and individual styles through Sulukan. So this is mainly listening to differences in the style of singing styles of um, three different puppeteers. Um, and I, there, I think, I, yeah, I mentioned that there are, well, there are several different um, regional variants of Jekdong style that are, are talked about. I, I'm probably talking about two of the, two or three of the better known ones. Um, another well-known one is, is in Malang. Um, and actually in Malang, there are a couple of different um, variants of the tradition. Um, but also around Surabaya, there, there, there are other areas that are said to have distinct traditions, but I, I have not had a, a, a sub-tradition. I haven't really had a chance to, to learn much about those uh, up to now. But the areas that I'm looking at are um, shown on this map, um, Troulan and Porong. Um, and you can even see how far apart they are from this Google Maps, uh, an hour apart. Um, the, tr these sub-traditions tend to be named after a locality, even though um, puppeteers who are actually active today are not necessarily from those areas. So these, they, it may mean simply that the, that puppeteer, you know, at some point in their life, they went to that town or they, they had associated with the Dalang who is from that area and then went back to where they live later on. So actually a lot of the puppeteers who practice uh, Porong style live in, in Mojokurto and, and there are, are Mojokurto style puppeteers who, who live in, in, um, in Sido Arto in the area where, where Porong is. Um, so I'm gonna, let's just get on to the, the, the influential puppeteers that I'm gonna be giving examples of here, of their Sulukan. Um, we heard earlier from uh, Ki Suwoto Gozali. Um, I will say 
we've, we've got enough. And he is from this, uh, he actually is from the town of Porong. Um, as a side note, um, kind of a disturbing side note, he is from the place, actually, if, if some of you may have heard of this um, mud volcano called um, Lumpur Lapindo that was probably, well, many people believe it was caused by a um, natural gas drilling accident in 2006. Um, but it's, it's the biggest uncontrollable mud flow in the world. Um, and that is actually in the town where, where Suoto Gozali is from, the, the village that he's from. So that village is, is under mud now. And that is Porong. That's where the Porong style is kind of from, in a sense. Um, he, he passed away before the mud flow happened. Um, so the second example that we'll look at is Ki Suleiman, probably the most famous puppeteer, um, Jekthong puppeteer, um, because he, I guess because he was alive long enough to start doing video CDs. He's already a prominent puppeteer when um, a lot of video media started coming out. Um, he's from uh, Pasuruan, from south of um, Porong, but he is known as a Porong style uh, Dalang. Um, he had some kind of, he's not strictly taught by Suoto Gozali. He actually kind of drew, drew from a few different performers to, to create his style, um, but he's a, considered a Porong style Dalang. And then the third example is uh, Ki Piet Asmoro from the other, the other uh, area of uh, Trobulan Mojokurto. Um, and with, with regard to that, it's worth mentioning that um, Trobulan is very well known as um, an archaeological site for uh, remnants of the Mojopahit kingdom, um, biggest Javanese kingdom in the, from about the 13th to the 16th centuries. Um, it's uh, I haven't actually been there, but it's it's believed to be the the royal seat of the Mojopai kingdom. At least at least some people believe that that is the is the center of the kingdom, um, and it is also the considered to be the place where Jekdong shadow puppetry originated. Uh, Pete Asmora himself was probably born around 1920, around the same time as as uh, Suwoto, um, and he was similarly similarly influential in Surabaya, um, helping the fledgling Eredi Surabaya group define its playing style, um, which can really be defined as an elevated adaptation of earlier playing styles in the region. And it draws more than anything else on the Mojo Kurto uh, tradition. Uh, so Pete Asmoro was working with Eredi in the late 40s and early 1950s on, on kind of developing their, their style. So now we can get to the, um, these recordings of, the, what we're gonna listen to here are the, um, this is the first um, uh, suluk that comes immediately after um, Gondo Kusuma is finished, um, called Proboti Larso by Suoto Ghazali calls it Proboti Larso. Um, Suleiman just calls it the first sendon. Um, and sendon is a term that um, is used in, in the Jekdong tradition just to refer to sort of a neutral um, mood piece that's, that's calm, relatively calm, like a Patatan in, uh, that, that has vocals in, in Central Java. Does not necessarily have a sad um, implication. Shalokane wong awayan Kacario Pambukane Jarito Pi Sang Pratunggo Miwa Shwaraning Waranggono Kain Troy Sining Pawono Mino Poho Nesing Driyo E Nayo Mangayo Bakyo Maring poro pamrikso Maring poro pamyarso Soto bo oh, oh, yo oh, Is that one, is that come through clear? I hope it's okay there. Um, so again, we have the that, uh, mentioning a lot about the physical setting of the performance like I, like I was describing earlier. Um, 
the other, mainly, I, I should have said this earlier, but I mainly wanted you to listen for the melody that he's singing. And another um, aspect of this that is, is very interesting about East Javanese music, uh, uh, Sulukan really, especially, is that the um, Gender Panarus takes a very important role. And the, the Suling as well, they, they'll pretty much play the, the, the main kind of melody of the, um, or an ornamented version of the of this main melody of the of leading melody of the of these these silicon. So you, you can listen for that in the next um, the next example. Um, you listen for the for this. Um, prominence of the of the Gender um, uh, Now the second example, um, like I said, it's it's actually uh, I think that Keith Suleiman calls it send on. Um, Pisan or Sapisan, the first sendon. Um, and I only, I haven't gotten finished with translating this one or, or transcribing it. Um, so I just have the first few lines of it here. And hopefully if you have enough memory of that last one, you can have recognized that there's a similarity in, in the melody, but the underlying melody, but the vocal um, contours that he uses are, are very different. Um, so we'll, let's try hearing that. Salukaning Wongawai Yon no merang, yon no merang Pambukane Wongawai yang binarungi So we can we'll stop stop there with this one. Um, the uh, what's I going to say? So one. When I think I talked a little bit already about the apprenticeships um, uh, ch per, or chantrik, uh, younger dalang will often do a very close association with an older dalang. And part of the result of that is there are a lot of dalang who not only will imitate the, um, the, the melodies that are sung by the puppeteer, but they'll, they'll actually really go as much as they can to imitate the vocal timbre. Um, the delivery, the phrasing, they'll, they'll pretty much try to do it to sound exactly like that um, teacher puppeteer. Uh, not everybody does that, but it is common. And actually, when I met um, um, Ki Toyib, the first darling that, that we talked about earlier, that was something he joked about. Like, he's one who said he doesn't really, he, he was a student of, of Pete Asmoro, um, but he, uh, he doesn't really, he, he says that he, and he definitely doesn't, he doesn't really imitate Pete Asmoro closely. And he, he joked that um, some, some, some puppeteers who are very loyal to their teacher will actually like go out of their way to imitate the sound system and get the same, same kind of distortion that their um, forebear Dalang had had, had, had in, in their own performances. Um, so yeah, this, this vocal quality, especially in these two different uh, Porongan style puppets. Here's the, the, a big difference just in the, their personal styles. Um, and these go on to be imitated by um, contemporary puppeteers now. Um, so let's see. One more example of, of uh, Sulukan by Pete Asmoro. And we'll just listen to a little bit of this one too. And so this style is very different I think you'll recognize it's, it sounds completely different. It, it took me a long time to um, get used to Pete Asmoro's voice. You'll see why. And, and it's also kind of interesting to, I'm always very struck by the, the, the Rabab sound that um, goes like this through the entire, um, entire performance of the Rabab player, the, the style of Rabab, I, I guess I won't say anything about it, but it it's, sounds recognizable instantly to me, the, the, the type of Rabab that we'll hear. Yeah. 
So sorry to cut that one off. But I think that that goes on for quite a while longer than the lick is much longer than the beginning part. Um, so to make a long story short, we're ta talking about distinguishing these um, local variants of Jekdong style. This is probably the biggest, most most apparent way of differentiating is between these um, styles of sulukan, uh, both the vocal tone and the, um, in this case, you know, totally different. Um, uh, content within the, you know, with, with uh, melodic content, words, everything is different pretty much in Pitas Moro style. And I would say throughout the performance, um, um, there are other other ways that you can hear a difference, like in the, the action pieces, uh, we're going to do a little, hopefully do a quick run through of some of those in a minute. Um, they're slightly different. Um, the pacing of the story, I think, is probably different depending on which uh, older puppeteers influencing, um, if, you know, if the younger puppeteers is very faithful to the older style, they may, um, things like that. But the, the biggest difference is in these um, vocal treatments of, of Sulukan. Um, so let's go. We'll go to the fourth topic. This one, I, I hope that we can do it really quickly. So we'll, um, I think we can skip over, I wanted to go through, um, there's about five or six different um, forms of what I'm calling action accompanying music um, in in Jekdong style. They're all they're all distinct to this. They're not really. I mean, there are other traditions that that borrow from from this, like um, the central Japanese. There, I think that on on one of the Purbas Moro recordings that, that you can that that Kitsi has published. Um, there's there's an example of of this this exact piece actually in I call it Ayatwalu, where I learned um, that in Central Java they, they they musicians gave it a different name, um, but it but yeah it does get used in other places but they're distinct um, action piece repertoire that that is just really from this Jackson tradition, um, and we'll just start here um, the topic here I call it twisting the melody, um, this is an interesting phenomenon that ha or interesting technique, I guess I should say, that happens in Jekdong performance um, where you, the same piece gets played over and over again through the night. Um, and the most prominent melodic part is um, played by two interlocking saron, um, the saron barung. Uh, so they, they kind of go back and forth between playing fast runs in a, a sort of imbal style. And then they'll go, they'll switch to, um, where one of them echoes the other one, and this is it's it's, it, it's tighter than what you would hear if 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 Sauron players were just only playing um, imbal the whole time, imbal Sauron the whole time, and and it's more kind of focused, more melodically consistent than than um, the Sauron Wayangan that you would hear in, in Central Java. So it, it has a stronger kind of identity, um, and so since they're playing Ayaolu over and over again, that um, these Sauron players will tend to keep choosing different um, interlocking melodies to play as, as the performance goes on. And some of them have contextual significance. Others are just probably to relieve boredom. Um, but, uh, well, let's just hear, we'll start with um, 
with sort of what I think of as the most sort of basic version of, of Aya'olu, the, the normal version. And this is Kampul Arang. This is the, the sort of slower, um, maybe it wouldn't accompany a fight or anything like that, but it, it would, might, might accompany just a little bit of tension that is starting to build up. Um, and this example starts off, uh, so I, I, I guess we'll go ahead and just, it's gonna be a little bit long. Um, starts off with a minute or so of, of two other types of sulukan. One of them is called Gregat Saut. If you are familiar with Central Javanese sulukan, this is kind of similar to Odo Odo. But it's accompanied with, you'll hear it, it's accompanied mainly with um, Gendarpanarus. And then the second one is called Gadingan, um, which is really a sort of elevated narration by the Dalang, while um, a group of several musicians um, Play, they play a, a metered piece, but it's without any drumming. So it kind of it kind of fits in between um, any of the categories that I would think of as being um, suluk or gending. It's, it has meter, but um, and it, the dalang does not sing, but it, but it's considered but it does, does not have drums, and it's, it's considered a, a type of suluk. So we'll hear that, and then we'll hear um, ayat walu, and you can follow that that notation. Here. <laughs> Is not the right uh, recording. So let's let's try. Um, I don't know if we can. I, I, in order to find that, I don't think I can find that quickly. I think that that, that actually is it includes the entire. Um, it's like a three-hour-long segment. So I think we might have to just skip this one. Um, we'll see it again on the next page. We'll have to hear it, but, um, hopefully, the next example is, is better. Um, so here is the the melody that we would have heard um, a minute ago. This is the second example. So this is um, a more lively version. It's ayat kumpul krap. It does not necessarily have to, these melodies are not fixed, whether it's ayat kumpul arang or kumpul krap. Um, but, in, but in this example, it, it does kind of fit in the sense that this is a, a livelier sounding melody than what we had in the um, kumpul arang version, even though, even though we didn't actually hear it. Um, so uh, let's see, I hope that hopefully this one will, will, be, will be the correct clip. Kurobok, layo, wong jenis pendito, wong jenis guru, opo manis siswa mage, hmm, rapi sini kadi kaya corat pilihan mana so, gelem tak boyong, tak gelem tak boyong, nang ngastino, aja bapa eh jaya corat, sanguniat bono tekan yang kacat tekan kudi. Dirangi ponco bakah wani perang. No, kau nangkap aku. Kau ada perang. Guru ni wang perang le. Telat telat. Guru apa? Oh, I'm sorry. That, if I if I click on my screen, I have I get problems with the recording. But I, I guess we heard we heard enough of that, um, probably to get a, a good sense of it. One thing that you can do 
we could maybe listen to just a little bit of it one more time. Um, one thing that you can do is, you know, you can sing the, the alternate, the, like the sort of basic melody of the, of the, of the Demung part um, while this is playing. It'll, it will sound okay, but, but the musicians who play Demung and who play Slendum, they tend to, um, they actually will listen for the imbal pattern that is being played on the, on the, the smaller Sauron and make their notes move so that they, so that they, um, most of the time will hit together with the with the Sauron part. Um, sometimes this can have a kind of a strange effect on the, the modal feeling. I, I have not really worked all the way through this, but um, it's it's very noticeable when you're listening to it that the, the mode just sounds yeah it starts to sound strange as 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 some of the inter inter intermediate tones. Not not the you notice that the um, end of the lines, the, the gong, well, sometimes they're gong and sometimes they're not. I didn't um, put gongs here because they're, they're very, um, they, they depend on a cue, whether there'll be a gong or not. But these, these cadence tones, those stay the same. And, and even the, the, the middle of the line, a lot of the time will stay the same. Um, but all of this, what attaches those main tones to the, um, to each other um, can, can be pretty flexible depending on what the, the Sauron, interlocking Sauron part um, chooses to do. Um, okay, so let's let's just go right to the next example. Actually, this is a really fun one. This is one of the things I was really happy to discover. Um, so this is a version of I, I, uh, that actually the, the last recording was um, Kisuoto uh, Kisuoto Gazali and his group, um, and this one is as well. Um, so this is a a, a version of Ayawalu. That he uses to introduce the the comedy scene, the Goro Goro scene. Um, this is still in um, Akta Walu, and um, let's just go ahead and hear it. It's it's very very entertaining uh, version. So you'll probably be shocked to hear what it sounds like. Munduri Sultan Bolodeo Batu Mundur Wangsul Mundur Baris Mali. Apa jenis kuro nangin kuro Baris Mutun ya Banerangka. Kalau dia nak mengkeliling waktu jadi nerangka, pamri yang bawa naik waktu yang sanes tegari berlepas tinggi waktu nangsal kalau dia ngalor itu si joto nengkol tipun asto supata saketo mengarui, umuripun petorok kerstot kacari to sareni kerstot topo sari buat mungkin kepok senggol, engkang meter ngalor itu mengangangi. Kaman pamukas cokol lada sungupi pertapan balik kambang pertapan kaya tikta jakat pusing alam horak donyo koro koro. I could could see people that you must be laughing at that. Um, anyway, that that's so. This is an, an example of a technique that gets used. One of the ways that um, I, I can be varied is by sort of inserting other songs into it. Um, in this case, they 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 said they made up this arrangement so that they actually able to put a, a little part of this um, piece called Chao Gleta. Um, it's a funny piece. It's it's a it's like one of the most raucous pieces in uh, a lot of different Tayuban and, and Surabaya um, Panda and traditions. It's, it's one of the kind of craziest pieces that gets played. So usually the people that would ask for it are people who really want to um, jump around and joke around, do, do funny stuff. Uh, so I'll just play a, a little one round of this piece called Chao Galeta. It's um, in Central Java, I believe that this is the same. It's a similar piece or almost the same piece as a piece called uh, Gondorio. 
in in uh, in Solo, Gondor, Gending Gondori or uh, Ladrang, or I'm not sure if it's Ladrang or Lancharan there, but anyway, here 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 is what, just one quick round of Chao Kleta. Mari manuk jala, aku jaluk manuk mana? Terus nama manuk mana? Manuk peking. Oh. Ya, ya. Peking, peking pada ni kambelan. Oh, Tertawa peking. Gak. Peking. Peking mana peking? Manuk peking. Manuk peking, peking. the next another round the same thing but with a different if you can understand the javanese there's a different different bird that they talk about in the next verse um, let's see. okay now this is the so this is the last example that i have so we're, we're finally at the end of end of the night and this is just one more um example of a, a song that gets inserted in and, and modifies modifies the melody of of I, I, walu but um as you'll see it still doesn't change the kind of basic um gong tones or cadence tones, but it, but it really changes the melody a lot because this is a Madari song. You'll notice that the, the vocal melody does not really sound like a Javanese song. Um, and and this will pretty much be it. This is it for, for what I want to uh, show you. So after this, we'll be ready to um, to talk. But um, well, let's, yeah, let's, let's just listen to this and then, then we'll, be, we'll be done with the, my part, my, my presentation will be done. And this this example is by uh, Ki Suleiman, by the way. So this is a different puppeteer. <laughs> Okay, so there we go. Oh, nice. I don't know how that happened. But <laughs> okay, so are we ready to? Does anybody have a question already or comment? Steve, thank you. Just want to say, first of all, before we get to any uh, questions or comments, thank you for putting this presentation together. Some of those examples, those recordings were just incredible. Yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for listening. It took a lot of stamina to listen. I don't know what time it is, but. Uh, yeah, not as long as a Wayang, not as long as an actual Wayang performance. And the, you know, this lecture promoted prompted a lot of discussion in the chat during the uh, lecture. You know, which is always interesting because um, sort of like two different things going on at one time. Yeah. Um, but if anybody uh, that did uh, text or put something in the chat that you would like to expand upon some of the comments that you made, um, feel free because I think there's some interesting comments that were made during the. Uh, in the group chat. Um, let me see about questions here. So even though uh, Patsumarsan has a question and wants to go second, it's actually the first one. So, uh, so please, Patsumarsan, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, me first? Yeah, that would be good. Okay, not good. Not my... <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me good? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, uh, I want to ask question because this is very, very important topics uh, in regard to uh, the relationship between one region and the others. Mm -hmm. Particularly, of course, you are emphasizing on the solo Jogja and Java Timur. And of course, we all need to 
remember that everything that we're doing in Solo Jogja actually start from East Java. Right. Uh, and Panji story is one of the example how powerful, how popular is Panji story that across North Coast of Java, across to South, uh, mainland South is Asia, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, Malaysia, mm -hmm. and then to Solo and Jogja. <laughs> and that is why uh, even in, uh, it's Panji uh, story is being celebrated, even though Wayang Kedok is already not exist anymore, but you still see that the, uh, the uh, mask dance clono is always being performed. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like to celebrate the East Japanese <laughs> things, as well as if you think about the Mangkunegaran, uh, what's it called, Menak Konsar. How can Menak Konsar be celebrated in Mangkunegaran? But he is the, he was the region of Lumaja. Hmm. That, I've heard of that. I don't know that. I, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it's about. But yeah, yeah. But uh, the thing is, uh, uh, I am interested in your example of Pelungan, mm -hmm. Pelungan right? Yeah. And, and in Pelungan is, uh, I think you said something. Uh, what uh, you define it as something to do with the communals of, of uh, I, I don't remember but. the text. Well, just his. It's just Suoto's particular text that he uses. Yeah. Right. But for me. Uh, Palungan is incantation, mm -hmm. prayer. See, and and in can, uh, Palungan is not only exists in East Java. That was a exists in uh, uh, Wayang Kule in Batang, Pekalongan, Pemalang, Tegal, oh, and okay. Wayang Kule in Cirebon, and Wayang Kule in Sunda, mm -hmm. and Wayang Kule in Banyumas. That I did not know. They all has the Pelungan, but different texts. Mm. And in, in Bali, they do have a Pelungan for the Bayang. So that's across the board. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, so this is a, a lot of work to be done in terms of trying to make relationship between regions and the other. Uh, I, and I also the idea of uh, the Samar and Bakong. Mm -hmm. And the two main, two yeah. main, yeah. and that's across the board. There's <laughs> Bali, of course, is only a pair of two. Yeah, and, and Banyumas, I think as well, of course. And, and, but Madura, and in, only in Solo that they have a port, but if you read uh, the uh, 18th century Bapat uh, Mangkunegaran, there's only two also, and the Bakong and Samar appears in that moment. Uh, so we want to ask question, who is Petro? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, well, this is, might be a joke, maybe not. Maybe Petro is a, is a European, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to ask you these questions. Uh, what about the Kinder Panros? Uh, I think there's always this idea that uh, Java Timur Kinder Pandros is more important than... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and a question. Was, that... Yeah, it's on that, that's one question. But can you explain that? And another question is the movement of the Bayang, the fight scenes. There's, there, uh, I probably you already study of the different movement. And one of them that I know of is a, a Kuputaro. Right? Mm -hmm. By fighting, so maybe you add more. I did a little bit of uh, research in Java Timur. I met I remember. Pakistan. I met uh, <laughs> Pak pa Wardono from Mojokerto. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, my uh, friends, uh, late Pak Jumiran, was. Uh, yeah, yeah. There them. was a clip. I wanted to show a clip of Pak Wardono's The Perang Kuputarung. I wanted to show that actually, but I think it's, I think it got to be too late. That was going to be my last part originally. <laughs> <laughs> So can you ask, uh, add something about uh, uh, Kinder Panros and... A little bit. I, I, I not really answers, but I can say something about them. Um, so I, I did, I think I forgot to mention earlier, um, with the term Palungan, the explication of that word that I have heard, um, this is also, I saw in the text box, there's a question about this too. Explication that I've heard uh, from people and, and in one of, the, one of the books that has been published on East Javanese Suluk, is um, from the word lung, and it's sort of like a lung meaning like a vine. Yeah. Um, and so some people have interpreted 
it to be a like a vine, a song that is like a vine representing the continuity of the of that puppetry tradition. Mm. Um, so each each time somebody sings it, it's like another leaf on the vine. That's a, that's a metaphor that, that I have heard people use. Um, so Pulungan, like literally, you could translate it like um, vine song. And it, it, the Pulungan is also called Drojogan. Um, and depends a little bit on, on what puppeteer, what, what kind of scene you're in. But um, Drojogan doesn't have quite the same meaning. The interpretation that I have of that that I have read is um, fall is something to do with falling. And, and people say it's just like the, the, the puppeteer sort of suddenly falls in. The, the person, the spirit of the Dalang sort of just falls into place, like at the time that the Drojogan happens. Great. I just, uh, just interrupt a little bit. What is interesting in Tegal, in Wayang Golek Tegal, that Palungan is called Ngabur. <laughs> <laughs> which is very interesting. Of yeah. course, in yeah, it's called Murwo, which is a uh, well, well, that's why that's why I didn't know that there were other ones. <laughs> there are different names. <laughs> um, so that that yeah, I can't really def go very far beyond that though in terms of the meaning. And with Gender Panor, it's the same the same thing. Like yeah, people say that Gender Panor is very is very important in Jack Dong puppetry. Um, it's very rare. In a lot of circumstances, actually, I found in when I was in Surabaya that it, it's difficult to get musicians and, and artists to um, go into like a kind of deep interpretation mode or, you know, like a, um, trying to give their take on this folklore that is very, I mean, a lot of the time it's, it's not very well known, even, even by people who are expert practitioners, they don't really know that much necessarily about the where things came from. And, and it, I, I always find it interesting that in Surabaya in particular, it seems like people don't, um, they don't really fake it. Like they wouldn't make it up. If, if they don't know something, they'll, they'll just say that, you know, that's just how it is and that's, that's all they know. So that's pretty much what I heard about Gender Panarus. But one thing that you do notice, that I notice, um, especially in Ludruk performances, that those Ludruk performances when, um, when uh, including ones where they, where they play um, Jack Dong music as accompaniment to Ludruk, um, You'll sometimes see a musician playing a a, a nine keyed saron like a, a saron like a saron wayangan playing it with mallets in in both hands and it's as if they're playing gender panarus. So there there it's possible that there's a history of like a gambang gongso or a, a, a nine keyed saron or la, a large saron of some sort. Maybe that had a role in the past. It's hard to imagine how the um, the gender panarus could have had an important role. At least in the louder music, like you know, it really needs to have a microphone in order to be audible. So, you know, in the, in the Sulukan, you can hear it easily. But just one, one more question. Yeah, it used to be uh, an, uh, a standard in the old East Japanese wayang that the talu is is a of different kind of kido, and one of them is kido toro balen. Do you heard anything? Yeah, kido balen. Yeah, yeah, I learned that is kido pecha. It has, it's called Giro Beche or Giro Balen. It, is like Choro, it does sound a lot like Choro Balen. The, the music sounds very similar to Choro Balen. It's, I guess that's interesting that you call it part of the Talu. Is I, I, I call it like part of the preliminary. Yeah. But um, just because I always called that. But I, yeah, I don't really know where you draw the line between all of this entertainment that goes on earlier in the evening and the, and the Talu. I don't, I don't know where that is. But it, it, yeah, it's many hours. So you could be a, quite a few... Um, loud playing pieces called Giro or Gagahan, that would be the fir very first thing that is played, and then some sort of Klemengan music. Um, and then eventually, get, it, this would be in a very traditional performance that doesn't, as far as I know, doesn't happen anymore. Good. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Let uh, people have a, uh, a chance to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's get... Does, All right. Matt, have a, yeah, we have a couple more. We got, we got like three, quest, three, four questions. So the first question, uh, Kathy Foley has a question about uh, Palungan. If uh, Kathy, you'd like to jump in, mm. uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, the question is: the words were those words that he made up and was putting into the song, or was it like a real murwa descended from his teacher's teacher's teacher? Because it sounded pretty new to me. He's as far back as it goes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The, the, the oral tradition um, for that particular Palungan. The other puppeteers, so 
um, that I mentioned earlier, um, Pete Asmoro and uh, Suleiman, they have, they have their own Pologan. Um, and I, I think that it is typical for a, for a Dalang to create their own variations. So, that, so like the, the one that is um, done by Ki Suleiman, who is also a Pologan style, ha has a lot of similar themes, but um, not exactly the same as, as Suwoto's. And, and I, yeah, I, I don't think that it's, um, well, I, I don't know actually if there's any claim to it being an ancient. Um, okay, because normally in a lot of places, it would have to be from their teacher and had certain things. And it could have some of those ideas, but not in that forthright style. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'll talk to Samar some about Punakawan. Why they're four? <laughs> four brothers. <laughs> Go ahead. What is what uh, the? Oh, do you, is that now or no? Are you going to do it later? Okay, you can talk to him about it later. You um, <laughs> <laughs> can't take too long. <laughs> I could answer yet, but, <laughs> but I think just this one of the Dalang in Mangunkar and the best good one because. Uh, but no, I don't remember his name now. But uh, the old Dalang, he always say he's sort of. Uh, this is from the second uh, person. The story is from Pak Marto, but he was told by Pak Wiknyo Dalang in Mangkun Karen. Then the this particular Dalang always have a uh, issue of describing or give a narration to Petro, and then he yeah. came. This idea that the Petro is not Japanese, but it's a new one. Yeah. But I, I want to add a little bit about that text uh, for Pelungan. I know it is very unique but uh, if, uh, for East Java, but for Bali, uh, Tegal, uh, Cirebon, Banyumas, and Sunda, the text is coming from the story of Bima Swarga. And that's mm. uh, typing about uh, Astaganga Viratun Tanu. Yeah. With the uh, the way how uh, all these people writing uh, in Lontan. That's an, are there sources for that? Are there are there published? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I wrote something a little bit of that. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. I must have missed it. <laughs> okay, we have a question actually from Kitsi. If I see she just mm. back to her computer, she can hear Kitsi. There she is. Oh, we can't hear you for some reason. You're unmuted, but there's no sound. Well, I can, I see the, uh, I don't know if, she's, if, if you're just asking who are the younger Dalang, I could say a little bit about yeah, that. If you want to expand your question and if you want to type it, let's see. So this was something I had hoped to include this in my, uh, in the, in the talk, but it just, as you, as you, as everybody saw, it got a little bit long. <laughs> so if, if we talk, uh, I'll talk first, I, I think maybe you mean, the, I don't know if you mean the very young Dalang, like the, the sort of ones who are fresh out of college or um, just Dalang who are still in their prime, you know, they may be 50 or 60 years old. Um, but I, I guess I'll talk about, since I, I completely didn't get to this topic of very young Dalang, um, and this I don't know, yeah, my, my, I'm speaking mainly from experience. I don't have a, a broad knowledge of, of them, but the two young puppeteers that I know um, are named, one of them is named Anom Surono, not, su, not Anom Suroto, but Anom Surono, um, is um, he, he went to um, Este Kawe, which is the, the, um, the college level sort of conservatory in Surabaya. And um, my impression of his performance is that he, uh, he really does introduce a lot of innovation into his performances, including a lot of, um, I, I don't remember what, what you called them in your book, Kitsi, but the, um, the, oh, I think I'm muted now. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
so these these uh, small little bits of, of music that are composed where the whole gamelan is playing very tightly. Um, in the case of these Anam Suroto, Su, Surono, Anam Surono um, arrangements that I've heard him have his group play, um, they have these choral singing parts that are by a, a lot of men, and they don't sound like Gerongan, um, but he, he's used several of them in, in a couple of performances that I've heard. Um, so it, I guess I, I can't say I know a lot about his style, but it is um, something that you could consider a, a contemporary style that's still based in Jekdong performance. And then the, the second performer that I know, uh, who is a, it's really of a younger generation, um, he went to school at EC Solo, but he, he's from, um, he is actually the son of Kiwar Dona, who we were talking about, um, about Marcel and I were talking about a little while ago, um, named Mas Aji when I, I met him. I met him only a couple of times. He is Mas Aji. Um, and he went to, yeah, so he went, studied Padalangan at EC Solo, but he's also the, you know, a, from his family, he's an East Javanese uh, puppeteer. Um, and the little bits of his that I've seen are, are very experimental. Um, a lot of, he switches into paylog tuning a lot. Um, and the other thing about him that is really interesting is that if you look at his um, YouTube site, he, his, his name in YouTube is um, Aji Dalang Metal, like heavy metal. He's Aji Dalang Metal. And he is also a, a pop, like a, like a heavy metal singer. So he has these, these, these metal like music videos that he does. And he also is a, a Jack Dong, puff, Dong puppeteer, um, also a, a Jack Dong drummer. He's a very talented young guy. Um, and I haven't seen him enough to know whether he brings, I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to know whether he brings any like metal music into his YM, but I, I don't know that. I haven't seen enough of him. Got a, a clarified question here from uh, Kitsi. She asked here, um, so she, she asked, um, I'll just read it. She said, actually the question was more about if the young performers in 20s and 30s are still performing in the idiom of Jack Dongan, because often I find in Kalatan and the Wonagiri and Sragan and Boyalali performers come back after schooling and don't use elements from their traditional background. I have a few examples, uh, anecdotes, but something's wrong with my mic, I guessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I think I understand that. I mean, I think I've seen it too. When I've been, I've seen, I actually have more familiarity probably with the very young generation Dalang in central Java than in, in Jack Dong tradition, just because there are not that many that I know, right? I mean, the, those two that I mentioned, that's, that's um, pretty much it. I know the son of another Dalang who became like a, just an all around um, performer. Actually, this one Dalang named um, Bambang Sugio, Ki, Ki Bambang Sugio, um, about the same age as Ki Wardono, so he's like in his 50s or 60s, still very traditional in his own performances. But his sons, um, two of his sons became comedian MCs. So they're the ones that take care of all of the preliminary performance. Um, I was talking about all of this like Champursari or Tayuban type of, they're the MCs for that. And then another of the sons is a, he's like a Jaipongan drummer, uh, but an East Japanese Jaipongan. So he sort of, he probably wouldn't really be able, I don't know if he would be able to get by like if he actually lived in Bandung or something, but, um, but he's a, yeah, he plays Jaipongan drums, plays some Jaipongan music and some East Javanese music is sort of adapted to become Jaipongan and he plays a lot and then Champur Sari. Um, so yeah, he's definitely, he, he's, I think, fluent in, in Jawati Muran. He definitely is, is you know, pretty fluent in Jawati Muran music, but he does a lot of different things. He also does um, like uh, a Jaranan group. He runs a Jaranan group, um, all kinds of things, which is true of a lot of East Javanese puppeteers. They often, their groups will also like they, they'll also perform Tayuban and they'll also sometimes do stage dramas and, and other things as well. So in Klingon. Um, cool. So the, the, yeah, I don't know if that's a great answer. There, there's, but, but the kind of, for a lot of puppeteers that, that traditional style, once the, once the Wayang starts, except for a few of these very young puppeteers, uh, um, they tend to stick pretty close to the, the type of repertory that I've been talking about. There's a couple, of, yeah, a couple of other dongs I can think of that, that mix in more popular music. Um, one in Malang that I know, and um, one in um, one who is based in Surabaya, who does a lot of Champur Sari type stuff in his Jack performances. 
Cool. Kiz, Kizzy also mentioned that she wanted to say that your examples were so beautiful. <laughs> and I'm yeah. so happy you're doing this work as part Mas, as I'm sorry, as Pat Marsum uh, said, so important to make these regional connections. Guys, I've known Steve since the mid nineties and respect his work. So thoughtful. <laughs> Mas Wakiti also wants to say hi. Uh, I hope he heard, I hope Pat Wakiti heard my nod to, earlier. I gave a nod to him. It's, it's, I really like my interest in East Java was from, initially was from his, his versions of, of like Walankekek and um, Jula Julie, he has a version of it and Godrill. Those were, that was what really kind of turned me on to like um, comical, like Gachulan music, which at, at first was what I really thought East Javanese music was all about. And then when you, of course, when you learn certain traditions like Wayang, it's, you know, it's not all comical music, but there, you know, there is a lot of really, really lively comical music in this. Steve, was it Tao Glita or Savo Glita? Well, I always, it depends on, I don't know. I, I mean, this is like, I don't know where you would find the answer, the, the def, definitive answer. People say both things. And I, I always like Tao Glita because people, um, so Chao is a drink, right? Chao is a type of ice drink that is popular, I think, probably everywhere in, in Java. Um, and Glita is like falls down. So it's like you drop your drink is the meaning of that title. And sawo glata would be like a, a fruit dropping from the, presumably, I guess, a sawo fruit dropping from a tree. I always imagine that sawo glata is like the cleaned up version of the title or something. Because what happens in a lot of Taiwan performances is that um, when chao glata plays, people will actually smash their like shot glass, um, or at least sort of that's the, the lore of it. I, I think I've only seen it done once. And that was in, a, in, a fr in the framework of a drama where they, they did it. Um, but so I tend to think that chocolate is right because it's a drink. This metaphor of, of like dropping your drink is very strong in it, or the reference to dropping your drink. <laughs> All right. Uh, are there any more questions or comments uh, for Steve that anybody wants to jump in on? We've had a pretty good discussion yeah. so far. Thanks for sticking it out. I, did, I think I may have gone longer than than the last one, longer than Chris. Is this, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is longer than Chris's or not. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, yeah. you can do one up it. But uh, yeah, this will, I, I'm, I apologize um, for not having the previous few lectures uh, uploaded uh, quite as fast as the original ones. I've sort of got bogged down in some stuff here, but I'll, I'll try to have all the, his lecture, Chris's lecture, and um, Mastriz's lecture up or Sunday, uh, in case anybody wants to refresh those or hasn't seen those uh, last couple lectures. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll call it a close. And Steve, thank you, that was awesome. It was something I didn't know very much about at all. <laughs> so it's very informative. Um, oh, we have one more question. We have okay. a late, late question from Butat. Butat, do you, would you like to- Chuck uh, Cartolo. Uh, <laughs> He's definitely part of Jekdong culture, in a sense. I mean, I don't think he's a Jekdong performer, but he, he, if I remember it right, there's a couple of biographies of him. I think he did spend some time playing, playing in Jekdong ensembles. Um, and um, of course he was at Ererdi. He was an Ererdi sort of by a performer for a few years before he sort of broke off on his own. So Cartolo, for people who don't know, um, Chuck Cartolo is, is sort of this really iconic comedian in Surabaya, um, the most famous, I, I almost think that he might be the most famous of his sort of type of comedian, even, even more so than um, some of the comedians in Central Java because he's, because Surabaya is such a big media market, he has a really big spread. Um, and he's, yeah, since the early seventies, he has been like the top comedian um, in Surabaya. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that he does, I know that in some of his cassettes, he has like about a hundred of these comedy cassettes with his, his group of about four or five other comedians. They're all um, Ludric actors and comedians and they can sing, um, good at singing Jula Jula, his whole, his whole crew. Um, but there are a couple of his cassettes where he actually like will become a Dalang in the, you know, within, the, within this little sort of Ludric, the, the cassettes are like, a small version of a Ludric story that's all comedy. It doesn't really have much of a plot. 
Um, but there are some, a couple of cassettes where he, he is a, his role is as a Dalang, and he can, he can definitely do the, the music. He can sing the sulukan and, and um, mannerisms and all. he can do all of that. 